Dr. Christopher Clark. Um, Chris is an associate professor in the Department of Evolution Ecology and Organismal Biology at UC Riverside. Chris has spent quite a bit of time on the West Coast. He received his bachelor's from Washington State University and his PhD is in integrative biology from the University of California at Berkeley. And then from Berkeley, Chris spent some time at the Peabody Museum at Yale as a postdoctoral associate. So I know Chris from his great organismal biology lab and field work, which integrates biomechanical tools to understand some really interesting behaviors in birds. So some of the topics I've really enjoyed learning about um, in Chris's work or through Chris's work um, are about how sounds produced during locomotion are also used to communicate other functions and the evolution of behavioral displays, which is always a fun topic, but especially in birds. So from talking with Chris at conferences, I've learned he's very passionate about teaching, which is one of the reasons that um, I invited him today is because I know he's going to give a really fun and dynamic seminar. Um, Chris, I hear, is an excellent teacher. And at UCR, he teaches a graduate level course in behavioral ecology. At the undergraduate level, he co-teaches vertebrate anatomy, and he teaches the evolution of terrestrial vertebrates, which I can only imagine some parts of that class must be inspired by the natural history of terrestrial vertebrates from UC Berkeley. Chris also has a great YouTube channel, which he uses to further engage his students. And I've heard that he's going to be recording this talk for the YouTube channel. So just before I hand it over to Chris, I just want to remind you all that we'll be taking questions after the seminar. All right, without further ado, welcome, Chris. All right, well, thank you, Rita. Uh, yeah, I figured in the, since, in the time of COVID, since we're all presenting through our computers anyway, uh, that I might as well record presentations that I give. Uh, you know, if I were to give a presentation that I didn't want out there, I wouldn't record it. But you know, most of them, like this one, uh, yeah, open for anybody. Uh, so I've started, yeah, all the presentations I've, I've been giving so far, I've, I've started putting up on my YouTube channel um, in case they're of interest. All right, so let's see. Singing hummingbird feathers and uh, evolution of quiet flights and, uh, in owls and other birds. Um, I'll actually explain what's going on on this slide, these two big swooshes uh, partway through the talk. <coughs> but instead, what I wanted to start with, since uh, right now it's February, uh, I unfortunately don't get to actually visit your campus, but your campus is presumably covered with Anna's hummingbirds right now, uh, kind of it, right in the middle of the swing of things with the breeding season. In fact, uh, I would expect females, the occasional female might be just starting her second nest uh, in breeding because of course what happens in California is that the uh, the winter rains arrive, you know, at least historically they arrived in November, uh, and that's when the plants would start to bloom, things like currants and, and monkey flower. And so the species that we have here in California, at least in the lowlands, are winter breeders. Hummingbirds are, are different from most birds uh, in that males don't provide any direct care for the offspring, uh, and so females are left on their own to make nests and raise their offspring. And so with the, And so the males uh, set up these large courtship territories, sometimes in the vicinity of, of flowering plants, sometimes not. Uh, and then when a female comes, uh, can you guys see my mouse? I'm moving my mouse around. Um, and I've got the chat open also, so I can monitor comments a little bit. Um, my mouse, yes, you can see it? Yes. Okay, great. So we've got a female perched down here in a tree. So when one of the courtship displays that males perform is they'll ascend about 100 uh, feet up in the air and then dive at high speed past the female. Uh, and they, when they do so, they make this sound. Oops. So kind of this loud chirp or this explosive squeak as it was, uh, has, has various people in the literature have called it. And so when I was getting my PhD at Berkeley, I was in the lab quite a bit doing various wind tunnel experiments on hummingbird flight. Um, and at some point, midway through my PhD, I realized, well, I'm, so I'm in the lab, I'm doing these perfectly good lab experiments, and I was thinking to myself, what am I doing? I, I, I really got into organismal biology because I like going outside. Uh, I, need, I need to find a project, I need to find a component of my PhD that would get me outside. And I was doing these experimental manipulations on Anna's hummingbird tail feathers, and so I became really aware uh, that they are sexually dimorphic, that the males, the tail feathers are slightly longer in males than they are in females. Uh, females have this white tip that male tail feathers don't have. Um, and 
I then went into the literature and I found this old paper from a graduate student. Rogers got his master's degree at, at UC Berkeley in 1940, and he published one of those papers that was kind of common back then. It was about two paragraphs long, and he argued that this sound chirp was made by the outer tail feathers. And uh, in, the, in the chat with some of you before the, the coffee, we were talking about Luis Baptista. Um, a few decades later, Baptista published this paper on the source of the dive noise of the Annus hummingbird. Baptista was convinced that this sound was a vocalization. This sound was not made by the tail feathers. And so when I read Baptista's paper in 1979, he was arguing the sound is vocal. And Rogers, uh, several decades earlier, had said that the sound was made by the tail feathers. Uh, I realized this would potentially be a pretty easy uh, hypothesis to actually test directly, since neither, neither side actually had uh, done a manipulation to a bird to see, if you mess with these outer tail feathers, what happens to the sound? And so that's what I did. I went to a park that was near UC Berkeley. Uh, before I did any, any sort of manipulation, the birds would dive and make that sound. And then if you mess with the outer tail feathers, this is what they sound like after manipulation. So there's still some sound as the bird shoots by the microphone at 60 miles an hour. Uh, and in the spectrogram, this faint tone, or this faint trill rather, right here is, is present before and after manipulation. This faint tone is present before and after manipulation, but the loud part of the dive sound, the beep, was uh, gone. And I figured out if you manipulate R4, the second outermost tail feather, the sound is affected, but it's still there. And if you do something to R3, it has no effect whatsoever on the bird's ability to make this sound. Okay, I also got high-speed videos uh, of the dive. So here's a male uh, high up in the dive. So they start off flapping their wings to, to accelerate and propel themselves uh, down towards the earth. As they approach the bottom of the dive, they briefly tuck their wings, then they spread their wings. And so this is the part of the dive where the male's experiencing really high G-forces to pull up. And then all of a sudden right there, he abruptly spreads his tail and has it spread right as he passes over the female. Okay, so the male's right here in this video tucks his wings, spreads. So I'm gonna pause it right there. So what we're, let me explain a little bit more of what we're seeing. So first off, the, the, the male is glowing. The reason why the male is glowing, Anna's hummingbirds, when they dive, they dive towards the sun. So in other words, they don't dive in a random direction. Uh, they, they will orient, so, so when, they're, when they're, they're diving, they're diving towards the sun. And what that means is that it's somewhat, it's relatively easy to get high speed video of their dives. All you have to do is set up with something to get, for the male to dive towards, uh, and then put the sun at your back and you know that the male will be diving towards you. Okay, what's this thing? This is a stuffed mount of a female Anna's hummingbird. Um, and she, I was, as a grad student, my, my taxidermy was not particularly good. And what I've done is she's got a stick coming out of her and I've then taped that to a much longer stick. And I've put that out on a male's territory uh, near one of his perches. And in the wild, I think the males really respond to female motion uh, and that's what they, that's how they're monitoring where females are on their territory. And so when you put a stuffed mount like this out that doesn't move at all, sometimes it takes a really long time for the male to notice that there's a, there's a thing that looks sort of like a female hummingbird on its territory. And it's also really common, so basically take the stick, you put it out on a territory, you prop it up, then it's really common for like a gust of wind to come up and knock your whole thing over and the mount goes flying. Um, and so the number one way that I would lose mounts is they, the wind would blow them over and the head would rip off and then I have to glue the head back on. Um, and so this one, you can't really tell because it's small, but the, yeah, the, the head's been re-glued back on a few times. A wing is ripped off completely. Uh, and I think this one, at the time this video was shot, this one also had a big bald spot on its back. Uh, and yet the male doesn't care. Here he comes. Okay, so he does something with his tail right at the bottom of the dive. Okay, so in short, high-speed videos, the kinematics are consistent with the idea that the male is doing something, uh, is making sounds with his tail. Uh, during the dive. The, the tail is spread for 1 20th of a second that exactly coincides with when the sound is produced. Okay, I could also show that the tail feathers were, uh, the, okay, so the, so the previous experiments show the tail feathers are uh, necessary for sound production. I can also show that they are sufficient for sound production. So what we're seeing in this video, this is R5 by itself, and I'm blowing air this direction across the feather. And so when you put a feather in a wind tunnel, it'll sound like this. It'll basically sit there making tonal sound for as long as you care to leave the feather in place. And so basically, in short, with experiments like this, putting the feathers in a wind tunnel, I can also demonstrate that the feathers are sufficient to make the dive sound. 
So what this did, I, as a grad student, I was studying flight biomechanics. I, until I did this experiment, I wasn't actually all that interested in sound. Uh, but what this had the effect of diverting my or deflecting my research trajectory. Uh, this was clearly interesting and uh, the experiments to, to actually figure out what's going on and how, how do animals make sounds as they move. Um, a lot of the experiments were pretty straightforward and, and had easy interpretations. So I call my lab the Animal Aeroacoustics Lab. Uh, this is me uh, appropriating a word aeroacoustics from engineers. And basically the, the idea is that uh, all motions generate some sort of sound. Like all of you have the experience of walking down the hall and as you walk, your feet make footsteps. Uh, or, uh, you know, for any of you that have small children, if you're trying to tiptoe out of a child's room, it's moving quietly that, that is actually the hard part. And so the idea is that in, in flight in particular, there are aerodynamic mechanisms in play over the wings and tail of, of an animal as it flies. And those mechanisms have an aeroacoustic signature. And so part of my research is about the connections between the aerodynamics and the aeroacoustics. What can flight tell us, or what, what can sounds tell us about how an animal is flying? And then the other side of this, the more interesting side, is how do the mechanics of how these sounds are made, how do they connect to an animal's ecology, how do they connect to its behavior, and how do they connect to uh, evolution? So what I'm going to do uh, for the rest of the talk is I'm going to jump th through a couple projects that I have going on in my lab. Um, and I'm realizing I want to make sure I have time for the, the owl stuff. So I might skip some of the stuff I've got coming up. Okay. So anyway, so I figured out that Anna's hummingbird is making loud sounds with its tail feathers. And uh, as I was doing the field work to, to nail that down, the first thing my mind turned to were the other species in this clade. So there's about 37 species in the bee hummingbird clade, including the other species we have here in North America, most of them. Um, and then also a bunch of species from Central and South America. So here's the dive sound from Alan's hummingbird. They make that thin whining sound with R3 and R4. Here's Calliope hummingbird. So that sound has two components. There's kind of a buzzing sound early in the sound that's made by the tail feathers. And then there's also vocalization, this bang sound that birds make. I'll play that again. And that's made by these kind of funny spade-shaped feathers that they have. Here's the purple-throated wood star from Ecuador. And so there again, there are two different sounds. There's kind of this ah, sound that's made by the outer tail feather. And there's also some snapping sounds that I think are made by the wings, although I'm not sure about that second part. Here is the volcano hummingbird from Costa Rica. So uh, that sound was kind of a and in the middle, there was an eh, eh, eh. the part is a vocalization. And it's the eh, eh, eh in the middle that is made with this kind of uh, tapered and notched uh, inner tail feather right here. And then down here, this is another California species. This is black chin hummingbird. So there's again two sounds there. There's kind of a sound. That's the sound made by the wings. And then there's a pure doo -doo 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 sound, and that part is made by the tail feathers. So in black chin hummingbird, it's the outer tail feather. It's this tapered tip of the tail feather that makes uh, sound. And I suddenly remembered, I'm playing the sounds and talking kind of fast. Um, I hope I'm not talking over the sounds. I remember somebody was playing sounds on Zoom, and there was like a five second delay. Um, I do have the chat open. If there's something you want me to go back and replay, by all means, put, put it in the chat as I'm going. <coughs> Okay, so part of what's producing this diversity of sound is that different shapes of feathers flutter differently. So this is a calliope hummingbird tail feather exhibiting a torsional mode of flutter. Um, this is the anise hummingbird feather down here. This is a, the purple-throated wood star feather. For both of these, the back edge of the feather is fluttering, but you can kind of see that the, the, um, the motion of the, um, the fe this feather is, is a bit more impulsive, kind of a, jerking back and forth, whereas the anise hummingbird, the, the motion is more fluid. That affects how the harmonics of the sound that the feather produces are produced. And then I call this a tip mode, where it's basically the entire tip of the feather that's, that's uh, fluttering. So some of the diversity in this clay, some of the diversity of sounds that they're producing are, are produced by ch evolving changes to the shape of the tail feathers. Basically, you can think of the tail as a musical instrument. And you know, just like if you take a, a, a stringed instrument and you change the stiffness uh, or the, or the, the mass of, of the strings, that changes the sound that's produced. Much the same thing is happening in these feathers. 
Let's see, you also get allometric effects. So here's a, a tail feather from an Allen's hummingbird fluttering at a much higher frequency than this Anna's hummingbird tail feather, and that's simply an effect of size. And then feathers can also interact with each other. So this is, okay, this time I'm blowing the air in the other direction, uh, so this way across the feather. So this is R5 by itself, and the back of the feather is fluttering. Here's the neighboring feather, R4. On its own, R4 flutters at a much lower frequency than R5. But here are the two feathers together. They're not physically touching. This is a purely aerodynamic interaction between the two. And what's happening is that R4 is greatly amplifying the sound made by R5 by vibrating uh, sympathetically with, with R5. Uh, another one, the Allen's hummingbird dive sound, uh, they have the, the harmonic structure of the sound is complicated. This right here is the sound made by R3. This is this dark band right here. This is the second harmonic. This is the third harmonic. This faint thing right here is the fourth harmonic. And then the fifth harmonic of, the, of R3 is hidden. Um, this dark thing right here is not an integer multiple of this. This is instead made with R4. And so uh, what we, then this band right here is the interaction frequency between this main frequency and this frequency. We can see that over here in this graph. Here are the blue arrows. Here's the two kilohertz fundamental frequency of Allen's hummingbird, second harmonic, third harmonic, and so on. This is a harmonic stack. R4 makes this uh, seven kilohertz sound. And when we put the two feathers next to each other, we get all the blue peaks, we get the red peak, but we also get the purple interaction peaks. So this one is, so here's seven. This one is seven minus two, which is five. This one is seven plus two, which is nine. Um, and so basically in the lab, I can replicate all of the subtle features in this dive sound. Uh, and, and basically what's happening when Allen's hummingbirds dive uh, is that their, their tail feathers are interacting to produce additional frequencies of sound. These are calliope hummingbird tail feathers. That torsional mode that I showed you earlier, the reason why this species makes a buzzing sound when they dive is that the feathers are fluttering. The flutter itself doesn't make much sound, but it's instead that fl the feathers flutter and hit the, the neighboring feathers. And so that's, it's these collisions, that's the source of sound in calliope hummingbird. Okay, and then I'm actually I'm gonna mostly skip over this. This was a, a full page diagram in, in a, 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 a paper in the journal Evolution that I published recently. Basically, this is a phylogeny of bee hummingbirds and the colors here, so blue and then turning to green, the, the color relates to mode of, of vibration. Um, and then all the North American species, most of them it's the, are red, which is red is where the tip of the tail, uh, tail feather is fluttering. Um, and then things like calliope hummingbird, that's that torsional mode, uh, or here's Anna's hummingbird and Costa's hummingbird that instead of, have switched from having it be the tip of the feather that flutters to being the back edge of the feather that flutters. So uh, basically, uh, uh, how the feathers flutter are complicated, and this was my attempt to paint a whole bunch of stuff on a phylogeny. I'm, I'm kind of bombarding you with information. Let's, let's move on. Okay. <coughs> so, I, I now want to describe some of the research that we've done in my lab focusing on Costas hummingbird. Um, and what's funny about this species is that when these guys dive, they dive first, they, they do left-handed and right-handed dives. They first dive on one side of the female and then on the other, and they alternate back and forth. Uh, and so this species, their, their dive sound, which I'll play in just a minute, is really high pitched because their outer tail feather, R5, uh, is really narrow. Uh, and what's super weird about this species is that their vocalizations, their vocal song and their dive sound sound remarkably similar to each other. So this is a vocalization. And I should apologize, it's about eight kilohertz. Uh, I, presumably most of your computer speakers are capable of playing that high frequency of sound, but every now and then when I'm presenting this, somebody can't hear the sound. Um, and that's because what happens is as, as you get older, a lot of humans uh, lose their high frequency hearing. So anyway, I'll play it. This is the vocalization. And then when they dive, they make this sound with their tail feathers. Uh, and so what's, what's going on is that both of these sounds, they're very similar to each other. They're both about two seconds long. They both are frequency modulated, starting off at about six and a half or seven kilohertz, rising and then falling. There's some other features that you can't see on these two spectrograms that also match between the two of, two of them. The main difference is there's this little blip in the middle of the song that's missing from the dive sound. And uh, it's figuring out why would these birds make basically the same sound two different ways. Uh, this is not at me. So I published a paper, this is a decade ago, why do Clifty hummingbirds sing with both their tail and their syrinx? Uh, and we speculated that this was an apparent example of what we called sexual sensory bias. 
Um, I'm next going to describe some experiments that I've done recently to figure out more about how this sound is made and how this sound is made. But I, I need to be upfront. I still have no idea why they do this. The, the why would relate to female preferences, and I don't have any data on female preferences. OK, so hummingbirds are song learners. Um, and so when Katie Johnson joined my lab and I, I pitched a couple of projects, one of the pick projects that I pitched was, hey, let's, let's, let's learn more about hummingbirds and learn their songs. And, and Katie was game. Um, so my background, I know very little about song learning. I still know very little about song learning, but I do know how to keep hummingbirds alive in captivity. Um, and so some of our experiments are a little bit naive in terms of current hypotheses uh, that are out there. But basically, this is the idea that a young hummingbird, a young Costas hummingbird, hears songs from males of its own species. And that's what then causes this bird to later in life develop uh, songs that sound like, like its species. We do the same thing. I'm speaking English right now, and you guys are understanding it because I have prior exposure to English uh, when I was a baby, um, and so do uh, all of you. And this process has been studied for decades in songbirds. So somebody was mentioning Luis Baptista earlier and his, his work on, on uh, white crowned sparrows. Um, we know a whole bunch about how sparrows learn their songs. Hummingbirds are basically at the far end of the, of the phylogeny relative to songbirds. And until Katie came along, we knew almost nothing about how they learn their songs. And so what we did, Katie did the same experiment that, that uh, Baptista and many other people have done. If you raise baby birds in, in isolation chambers, and then you, you control what they're exposed to and see what they can produce. Um, and so if you, if you expose them to a normal Costa song, this one wasn't so good, but this one, this baby hummingbird produced a Costa song that was more or less the same as the, uh, as the song was exposed to. So then Katie manipulated the songs. Here's one where she chopped off the second half of the song and only played the first half. And here's the baby hummingbird singing just the first half of the song. Here's one, the songs sound pretty similar if you play them forward or backwards. The main difference are these little click elements that are laid in the song. And if you play the song backwards to the babies, they sing backwards song. Here's one, we, we, we also uh, played them the, the dive sound and can get the baby birds to sing the dive sound. Um, when I made, I was working on this talk last night and when I came to campus this morning, um, the one sound recording I didn't have easily available on my campus computer was uh, this one. When you get a baby humming, cost of something where it's singing the dive sound, it just gives me the willies because it's, it, it, yeah, the two, it, it's, uh, they sing it much faster in captivity than, than they actually dive. So it's just like when, when, when I'd go into the bird room and hear this bird singing the dive sound, it was, um, yeah, it was just a very weird experience for me. Um, and then this is Anna's hummingbird song, which uh, in terms of its tonal content is very different from Costa's hummingbird. And this is the, what the baby Costa's hummingbird sang. This is also what they sing when there are no, uh, when they get no stimuli or, or when they don't sing, so, or when they, when they don't learn. Um, so this is what we call isolate song. This is basically a, a baby hummingbird going do, 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 do. So basically th this bird or, or birds like this, uh, th this is an example of a failure to learn. So the upshot, this is, this is, I should say, this is one of those places where, uh, you know, the professor, the, the grad student has done, you know, years worth of work and the professor just blazes through with like, what are the coolest results that, that, that Katie found? The first is she uh, repeated the, the result that, that the literature had implied previously. We, we verified, yes, hummingbirds are song learners. Um, we figured out that their sensory and sensory motor periods overlap. This is, this is kind of inside information for any of you that, that might study song learning. They're, the development of song in hummingbirds closely resembled how zebra finches do it and not how sparrows do it. Uh, another result was that when Katie tried piping only sounds into her boxes, the babies would not learn the song. She found that she had to take an adult male costless hummingbird and stick it into the isolation chamber with the young hummingbird uh, in order to trigger learning. Uh, they have open-ended song learning, meaning that they can change their songs in adulthood. Uh, and Costa's hummingbirds raised with Anna's hummingbird song fail to sing Anna's hummingbird song. And this might be a species isola isolation mechanism. Here in Southern California, we have a whole lot of hybridization between Anna's hummingbirds and Costa's hummingbirds. And so uh, it might be that, that failing to learn song of the wrong species is one way that the songs of Anna's and Costa's remain just kind of two distinct entities. Um, and then subtle features of the songs were matched, suggesting they have pretty sharp perceptual abilities. So for example, this right here, where this baby is replicating this really high frequency blip, this is about 10 kilohertz right here. This is a frequency that most birds can't hear, but this baby Costa's hummingbird is replicating it here. And this one, where it's not being exposed to a 10 kilohertz sound, is not producing 10 kilohertz sounds. 
Um, and so this, this is further evidence that hummingbirds have, something has happened to their hearing that makes them different from other birds. And we don't really know what that is. Okay, so now, I'm, I, now onto the dive. Uh, and now I'll explain what's going on with these two swooshes. What we have here, this, this is a, a female in a cage down here. And this is two dives that a male has done on uh, one on one side of the female, one on the other side of the female. Uh, uh, showing these right and left-handed dives. And we've recorded this with what's called an acoustic camera. And I'll, I'll show a video in a little bit that shows what this looks like. So diving, there's a, there's a, a, a connection between this behavior in birds and, uh, and, and warfare and, and human and aircraft. So d for a brief period of time coinciding with World War II, dive bombers were kind of the state of the art for precision uh, delivery of, of munitions before we had, uh, bef before you know, laser guided bombs and things like that were, were invented. So the way that a dive bomber works is the airplane cruises along at elevation. When it, when it spots a, a target on the ground, it then does a roll and, and drops into a dive. And so early in the dive, speed picks up uh, and then the, then the dive bomber drops its munitions and then it pulls up out of the dive. This is the point when, when the, the aircraft experiences really high G-forces as it's pulling out. And in fact, uh, in dive bombers, it was pretty common for the fighter pilot, for the, for the pilot, the dive bomber pilot rather, uh, to black out because they would often hit uh, G-forces high enough that all the blood would go to their legs and out of their brain. And then they would pull up out of the dive. Now, chances are many of you have heard the sound effect of a dive bomber, which is this. And the, the, the origin behind that story is that the Nazis, to their dive bombers, they attached a siren to the bottom of the aircraft. And the way that this works is the faster the aircraft would go, the higher pitched the siren. So this was intended to be psychological warfare against uh, troops on the ground, that, that uh, the sound effect or the, this effect of a, of a dive bomber would, would give the troops on the ground the sensation that, you know, an, an airplane is diving after me. And uh, what happened after the war was that sound effect became really widespread in cartoons. So what's happening is that as the airplane picks up speed, the pitch of the sound is rising. And then, and then as the airplane pulls up out of the dive, the pitch falls again. Um, and that's very similar to what's going on in Costa's Hummingbird. Where the sound rises and then falls. Uh, and so we set out to do some experiments to better understand the mechanics of how the sound is made. So this, this Stuka dive bomber effect being part of it, but not the whole thing. So when I arrived at UC Riverside, uh, I built an acoustic wind tunnel. And basically the difference between this wind tunnel and a normal wind tunnel is that it's basically just a big fancy jet of air that empties into my lab. Um, and so basically this white thing right here is the contraction section, air comes out of this opening. And then right here, we've got a feather. Here's a close up of that feather in, in the airflow. And so uh, the lab tech, Emily, that I hired, uh, did a series of experiments where, so here's the feather, there's the Costa Summingard feather and airflow, and then she moved the microphones around the feather to map the sound field around the feather. Here's an output from the acoustic camera where we can differentiate between the source of sound itself and reflections, and we can measure the loudness just of the, of the directly, directly transmitted sound and, reflect, and ignore the, the, the amplitude of sound that's, that's coming to the camera from, from reflections. Um, and so we did a series of experiments. So, okay, so what we have here, airspeed, this is uh, where we could vary the, the airspeed of the tunnel. Basically, the faster the air goes, the higher the, or the louder the sound. Um, so diving at 15 meters per second is not as loud as diving at 20 meters per second. There is uh, uh, a really, uh, you know, just the basic physics of sound, the further you are from a source of sound, the quieter the sound is. And so this is, this is just us recapitulating the inverse distance law that sounds are loud right next to the feather and the further away you are, the quieter they are. In Costa's Hummingbird, we, we repeated the same effect that I showed previously for Anna's Hummingbird, which is that R4, the second outermost tail feather, amplifies the sound. So this is R5 by itself. Uh, there's about an 11 decibel increase in, in sound when you have R4 next to R5 and a flat plate that has the geometry but not the stiffness of R4 does not have the same effect. So this is specifically about the feather uh, uh, flexing and, and having a vibrational response to the feather and not just a physical response. The sounds are highly directional. So a feather that's doing this is beaming sound on axis around it. And this is also about a, an 11 decibel difference. If you're on the XY plane around this feather, the sound is, is about 11 or 12 decibels quieter than it is on the Z axis around the feather. 
And then finally, this one over here is that is the same as the, the, the same sound effect as in the Stuka dive bomber. The faster the, 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 the airflow, the higher the frequency of sound. So in other words, the faster the bird goes, um, the higher pitch the sound. And so in total, what, what these various results give us is that the loudness of the sound, it rises with speed, it falls with distance, it's boosted by the presence of tail feather R4, and the sound is highly directional. And the frequency, this, this last graph right here shows us that it rises with speed, but it's also affected by the Doppler effect. And these wind tunnel experiments don't include the Doppler effect. The microphone and the feather are not moving relative to each other. And so what we wanted to know is, is how do we layer the, the Doppler effect on top of these other physical effects of how the feathers make sound. So we did things like this. So here's, here's Emily, my lab tech. This white thing and this white thing, these are two acoustic cameras. This is a high-speed camera. Uh, here's another microphone, here's a microphone. Female in the cage is here and there's a microphone next to this cage. This microphone is to record the sound as the female hears it. So these acoustic cameras, what they do, just like your two ears can localize sound um, and using, it turns out, very sophisticated uh, mechanisms in your brain, the acoustic cameras work the same way. The sound that hits these 40 microphones, uh, the software uses beamforming to tell where the sound is coming from. Um, and so you can get video like this. Okay, so I'll play that again. So this is a male doing a left-handed and right-handed dive. And so what's happening uh, in, in this video, I've set the exposure so that it's leaving kind of the trace of where the bird was behind it. Um, so then, to, okay, so to understand the Doppler effect, what we, we made a model. So here's the female, here's the male. We have the trajectory, kind of a, a typical or average trajectory of the male. If we pretend that the male could literally fly through the female, we get this gray trajectory. And so then we wanted to know, so that what Costa's hummingbirds really do is they dive off to the side. The real trajectory is this green trajectory right here. But other species, when they dive, are more similar to this blue trajectory where the male dives in front of the female, this red trajectory where he dives behind the female, or the purple trajectory where he dives above the female. The Doppler effect is caused by uh, when a source moves relative to a receiver, there's two variables that matter. One is the velocity of the source, and the other is this angle theta. Uh, and the CPA, this stands for closest point of approach. So basically, when you have a, when you have a moving source that's moving, that's approaching and then moving past uh, the receiver, um, this angle theta is what's going to change as a function of the location of the CPA. So here's a velocity profile for a diving male. They, early in the dive, they're moving roughly 15 or so meters per second and the velocity rises and then falls. And so if, if we take this trajectory and we move it around in space, this angle theta, uh, the angle theta relative to the receiver, the time course of it is different in different locations. So these red trajectories, when the male passes by the female and dives behind her, uh, theta rises relatively early in the dive. Blue trajectories like this one over here, uh, the male is diving in front of the female, and so theta stays low for most of the dive, but then, then rises really rapidly. We couldn't actually test purple trajectories because we couldn't bury the microphones deep underground. Uh, that wasn't going to work. Uh, so I don't have any purple on this graph. And then green, this is what the birds actually do, where change in theta, uh, you, basically the green trajectories have the lowest uh, slope overall over the course of the dive. And so putting those together, this black line right here, this is the sound the male hears himself make. That's just this uh, on a slightly different scale. Um, so when the male is diving, he doesn't hear any Doppler effect on his own. These other three curves represent what the female would hear if the male dives in each of these three positions. And so what you can see is that the difference in pitch is, is substantial uh, depending on whether the male uh, is diving in front of the female or behind the female, or the real one is, is this green curve of diving off to her side. So to test this model, we then did, I've already showed you the methods some. We put a female in a cage and we put microphones out in the environment. Here's an example of seven dives uh, where the female, where the male is diving to the female. And you can see the odd dives are all on this side. The three even dives are on this side. So this is an example of the male doing these alternating dives of left and right, back and forth. Uh, and we lucked out, a few of the dives had the microphone positions very close to this model. So here, these are three sound recordings. They're of the exact same dive. 
The green one uh, is but was what the female actually heard, and it represents the male diving about four meters off to her side. Uh, and this blue dive and this red dive represent uh, microphones recording if the male is diving uh, in front of the microphone or behind the microphone. And so, it, so this over here, E, this was the model. Here's the actual empirical result. We get there's this sharp drop in pitch er, somewhat early in the dive uh, if, if the male follows, if the male dives uh, behind the female. We get this sharp drop in pitch late in the dive right here if the male dives in front of the female. And the actual real trajectory that they follow is this green one right here, where the slope of this line is the lowest uh, in, the, in the trajectory that the males actually pick. Okay, but there's a complication. Uh, the, if they spread their tail like other hummingbirds do when they dive, uh, I showed you earlier that the sounds are really directional. And so if a male spreads his tail normally, that should be in the sound down below him. And if that's the case, if the female's off the male side, he's actually not putting her in, in, the, in a very good part of the sound field. Um, and so this raised the question, are they doing, is this species doing anything special? Uh, and to answer that question, here's a high-speed video. So this is a male diving. And so what that video showed, here's a couple stills from the video. We're, we are seeing the male from the side, and you can clearly see the tail below the male's body. What he is doing is he is twisting his tail. And also, uh, separately, uh, we have figured out that he's only spreading half of his tail. He's not spreading both sides. He's just spreading one side of his tail when he dives. And so if we assume that he has spread his, he's twisted his tail 90 degrees, what that should do is that should rotate the sound field and project the sound sideways rather than above and below him. And so we made a model. So here's the black line. This is a, a real trajectory of a male and with a real female position. And then the, this color map, this is a model of how loud the sound should have been. And so you get this bilobe pattern, this lobe over here and this lobe over here. That's the effect of uh, the male twisting his tail, assuming that he's twisting at 90 degrees. Um, <clears throat> and so you can see the sound is falling with distance, uh, but that this directionality of the, of the sound is uh, producing a somewhat substantial effect. So then to test this model, we went back to our acoustic camera videos. Uh, and since we had a bunch of videos for, with two cameras from two camera positions of birds diving, we could then actually ask, what's the real uh, angle of the dive relative to the camera? And we found a somewhat pronounced uh, effect of birds diving uh, off to the side of the camera relative to towards the camera. Um, so here's an example. Here are two. This is at the Bot Gardens at UC Riverside. These are two videos uh, of, the, of showing the exact same instance in time. This video, the camera is actually further away, but the red blob, the, the sound is louder in, from this orientation, 80 degrees, than it was at this orientation of, of 26 degrees. And these two stars correspond to this point and this point in the graph. Overall, what these data indicate is that uh, by twisting the tail, the male, uh, the, the empirical data from the field suggests increases the loudness of the sound that the female hears by eight decibels. Um, so basically, what, what twisting their tail underneath their body does is it, is it puts the female in the sound field. Uh, males are aiming their sound towards the female when they dive. I have no idea why they only spread half their tail. Uh, at first, I thought maybe they were avoiding two-point interference between the two sides of their tail because the, the, the sound they're producing is really high-pitched, and so the, the two sides of the tail are actually in the far field relative to each other. Um, I had Emily do all these experiments, and this was one of those cases where at first I didn't believe her when she came back and had no evidence of two-point interference. Um, and, but anyway, I, so I then, okay, let me do it. And I, this was one of those cases where, you know, tr you, trust your help, trust, trust the people working with you. Uh, she was correct. Turns out uh, two-point interference only works if the feathers are coherent sound sources, and I could show in the wind tunnel that they're not coherent. So my hypothesis now about why do they only spread half the tail, maybe it's an anatomical constraint. Maybe they can spread the tail below their body, but they can't spread the tail above their body. Okay, I think for time, I'm gonna skip over that. Basically, uh, so the, the, the overarching picture here, the question that I started with is why do they produce this sound vocally? And why do they produce this sound with their tail feathers? I can now make really precise statements about how these two sounds match each other in terms of what the animal is capable of, capable of doing. Uh, I still have no idea, so, so I know a lot about how the sounds are produced, but I still have no idea why there's this match. Uh, and what it must come down to is female perceptions of these displays and female choice, 
But it turns out hummingbirds are really hard to study female choice in. Um, methods that work for other kinds of birds don't work for hummingbirds. And so I have absolutely no data to actually understand why are females driving this pattern of males making two different sounds that sound the same but are made with completely different parts of their anatomy. Okay. So in the remaining time that I have, I want to switch uh, topics a bit and talk about uh, some of the newer stuff I've been working on. Um, and that's instead of considering how animals make extra sound when they fly, it's about how they fly quietly instead. Let's see, and it's, I'm noticing the time, it's almost 10.15. Okay, I'm gonna have to skip some stuff. Um, the context for this is that neuroethologists have studied owl hearing a ton. Owls, are, owls and owl brains are a model system for how animals uh, localize sound in space. And separately, engineers have studied the heck out of owl wings seeking bio-inspiration for quiet flight. And owls are, you know, owls are famous for quiet flight and there's lots and lots of engineering papers that all kind of say the same thing about uh, owls. But in between these two fields, uh, we know almost nothing about uh, the ecology or evolution of quiet flight. Uh, and it looks like uh, Rita just told me, so go to 1030. Yeah, this next part, this will take about 15 minutes. So I, I will go straight to 1030 and I don't mind if you have to leave early. Okay, so we, we know almost nothing about the ecology or, or evolution of quiet flight. And so uh, I started off by writing a review, um, Evolution and Ecology of Quiet Flight in Owls and Other Flying Vertebrates, uh, just to figure out where are, we, where are we, and especially I use this review to try to figure out what are the really easy questions that a, biology, a biologist could answer about this uh, predator-prey interaction. So the first is that apparently quiet flight is only present in predators. Uh, if any of you have examples of quiet flight in something that's not a predator, I'd love to hear about it later. But for now, we're, I'm going to frame this talk as if this is true, that, it's, that predators are the things that evolve quiet flight. And there's two main hypotheses as to what quiet flight does for the predator. The first is the self-masking or, or owl ear hypothesis. I find it easiest to think about this by expressly talking about the ears that we care about for this, this hypothesis. And the other is the stealth or mouse ear hypothesis. So the owl ear hypothesis uh, says that wing sounds produced by the owl might interfere with its own hearing. The wing sounds occur in the context of background sound in the environment. And the owl or the, or the, the animal that has quiet flight uh, is going to be uh, listening for prey where the prey have to make noise and that noise gets uh, transmitted through the environment to the owl. And so whether or not the quiet flight benefits the owl is a, is a signal to noise ratio that's about the signal, which is to say the sound from the, from the, the mouse going to the owl uh, in the context of masking, which is caused by background sound and wing sound. And all of this matters if the, if the predator, the owl in this case, uh, can hear. Okay, the stealth hypothesis says that instead, wing sounds transmit through the environment to the prey, to the mouse. Uh, and the mouse is also existing in the context of background sound. Um, and so whether or not quiet flight is needed for stealth is a function of, again, a signal to noise ratio. But this time, uh, or yeah, so, and so the background sound is still in the denominator, but this time it's about the prey's hearing ability rather than the predator's hearing ability. Okay. So this, this is just a summary of these two mechanisms. So these two mechanisms are not mutually exclusive. It's, it's entirely possible that an owl would have quiet flight, both so that it can hear better, but also so that the mouse uh, doesn't hear it coming. But there are a few predictions that these models make that are different. So one is that the role of background sound is different. Uh, increasing background sound should improve the hunting success of the owl under the stealth hypothesis, but it should decrease the hunting success under the self-masking hypothesis. And that's because the, uh, the background sound interferes with the owl's hearing uh, if the owl is listening for prey, but it helps provide stealth naturally if, if it's about sneaking up on mice. And so the, the few experiments, and, and background sound is really easy to manipulate, the few studies that have done it have generally found that owl hunting success goes down. And so that supports the, the owl ear hypothesis over the mouse ear hypothesis. And then the other one that's really fun, uh, some owls hunt through snow. And so this is an ecological context where the owl is completely reliant on sound. So lots of owls use vision to hunt prey, but if you're gonna take a vole from underneath a layer of snow, you're doing it only based on sound. And snow both is a really good absorber of sound and it also refracts sound. And it will tend to, because the speed of sound is faster in snow than it is in air, it'll tend to refract the sound of an owl away from a mouse or a vole. And so uh, 
the mouse hypothesis says uh, owls hunting through snow don't really need quiet flight so much because the snow provides the stealth already. Whereas the owl here hypothesis says this is, the, this is the ecological context where quiet flight is absolutely the most important. You've got a quiet background uh, and uh, the prey sounds are going to be really faint. And so this is the point in time where your wing sounds could most interfere with your hearing. Uh, and when I squint and wave my arms um, and look at the data, it seems to me that this, the, the owls that do hunt through snow tend to have really well-developed uh, quieting features also. So the very small amount of available data for this question also favors the, the owl ear hypothesis over the mouse ear hypothesis. Okay, but rather than talking more about owls, instead I wanted to focus on something else. So lots of papers written about quiet flight start off, they all have kind of generic introductions where they start off saying owls are unique in having quiet flight. And that is not true. Uh, other organisms or other birds have evolved quiet flight. So this is a paper that I published in SickBee's journal, uh, Evolutionary and Ecological Correlates of Quiet Flight in Nightbirds, Hawks, Falcons, and Owls. Um, so here's a, a sort of truncated phylogeny of birds. Owls are up here, and I've got these little cartoons. Owls have these three wing features. Uh, so they have kind of this, this, uh, the, this leading edge comb that, that uh, when the air uh, meets the leading edge of the wing, the comb in some way affects turbulence to reduce sound. Their feathers are fuzzy. They've got this velvet on them and they're soft to the touch to human fingers. And then a lot of their feathers have, instead of having a, 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 a straight margin, they've got a fringed or a wispy margin. So these are the, these are the three traits that, that they use to reduce sound. Well, owls are not the only ones to have these traits. The nightbirds uh, down here, a bunch of clades within the nightbirds also have so, some fraction of these wing traits. Uh, also notice I've got a passeriform that has it, and I also have a, a, a hawk that has it as one of the traits. So within night birds, um, the capromulgids, these are night jars and night hawks. These guys eat insects they take on the wing, mostly. Uh, the potus, nictividae, these guys also mostly eat insects that they take on the wing. Uh, the oil bird uh, is this incredibly weird single species in its own bird family. It does not eat insects, it eats fruit and it echolocates. Uh, the frog mouths, Podargidae, they again uh, are back to eating insects, but this time these guys take, they sometimes take mammals like, like mice and they often take insects on the ground rather than aerially hawking them in the air. Then the outlet night jars are right here and we're back to eating flying insects. And then finally also nested inside the night birds are, are hummingbirds and swifts. Okay, uh, and then, oh yeah, up here, so hawks, uh, there are some hawks that, that hunt acoustically. This is a picture of a northern harrier. They have the same, this same uh, facial ruff that owls do. Uh, and, uh, oops. and also we have uh, things like kites. There is a species of kite that is sometimes nocturnal and kites have particularly large eyes and they're, they're fairly carpuscular in their, in their hunting habits. And so there, there's at least one paper that suggests, but doesn't actually have any data to support it, that suggests that these guys hunt by ear also. Um, and then, okay, falcons are over here, and uh, I'm introducing them here because they're gonna be important uh, in a couple minutes. Uh, okay, and then vultures, uh, I'm gonna skip over that. Okay, so the analysis that I did here was really simple. Um, so the self-masking hypothesis and the stealth hypothesis Self-masking predicts that the predator uses sound to hunt, uh, that they, uh, the wing sounds that they produce might mask prey sounds, uh, and that quieting features in their wings uh, reduces this masking. Although actually, in reality, there wasn't good data in the literature for B and C, so mostly just A is what I was gonna use. Uh, and then the stealth hypothesis instead predicts that the, the, the predator is hunting prey that can hear. The wing sounds the predator makes are audible to prey, and the quieting features in the, the, the features that reduce the wing sounds of the predator uh, reduce the audibility of the wing sounds to the prey. So what I did is I went to the Burke Museum uh, in Seattle and I measured how much velvet wings had on a whole bunch of species of, of bird because it was the, the velvet, um, so the velvet is what makes owl feathers uh, soft to the touch and uh, the, the working hypothesis that I have that I'm not gonna present data on, but uh, at this point, lots of data, is that the way that, that the velvet works is it reduces the sound that feathers make when they rub against each other. Um, and so the, the score for how much velvet the birds had, I, I came up with a three point scale. So zero was, was a feather like this where there's, there's no velvet. 
a one was a score where feathers had some velvet on them, and then a two was a score of a feather that had lots and lots of velvet. And so what I found, uh, these the symbols here, this is what we previously knew from, from the literature. Well, I found examples of velvet on additional species, including in potus, uh, the, the owlet night jars. I checked oil birds. Oil birds definitely did not have any velvet. So they, this is a, a derived loss of quieting features within the night birds. Also, an undergrad in my lab found, figured out that kestrels have velvet also. This was, the literature told us about these guys and about this and about this, uh, but there's nothing in literature that we, we'd found that suggested that kestrels might also have quiet flight. So of the various birds that I measured, uh, I've measured a bunch of points on their wing. Um, a whole lot of birds spelled over here, getting a velvet score of zero, no velvet anywhere on their wing. Um, then we had some birds like condors, some pigeons, the caracara that had a little bit of velvet. Um, and as we increase our way up the scale, kestrels had some, they were, they were intermediate. Um, then we start, when we get to a score of 1.2, this is where we start picking up some of the owls, especially pygmy owls, which hunt, they're, they're visual hunters and they're diurnal. Um, and also things like kites and harriers. Uh, and then all the way over here at this end of the scale, we've got um, owls or some other owls and owlet night jars. And then finally, at, kind of at the top end of the scale that I came up with, uh, frog mouths have just as much velvet as do owls like sawwet owl or great gray owl, where these species, great grays and sawwets, these are some of the owls that are really focused on using sound when they hunt. Okay, one of the patterns was that the species uh, that had velvet, it was always best developed in places where feathers overlay other feathers. Uh, so here's a common nighthawk wing where I, here's P9 in place. When you peel P9 away, the velvet is right here uh, in between P9 and P10. This is exactly where you would expect it to be if its function is to reduce frictional sounds of feathers rubbing against other feathers. And it's not in, in the boundary layer of air over the wing. So it's not where you would expect it to be if its function is to reduce turbulence sound. Here's a kestrel. This is not the best picture, but again, we've got, the, I peeled the overlaying feather away. The, there's thick velvet here in between the feathers, and there's no velvet over here in the part that's exposed to air. Uh, and then here's, a, here's an image I took from a kite, again, showing the same thing. I've, over, I've removed the overlaying feather. Velvet is really thick where the feathers overlap. It's not thick out here in the part that's exposed to air. Okay, so in, in total, uh, the velvet is pretty widespread in uh, night birds. Uh, multiple hawk species have it. Uh, it's found in almost all owls, and at least one falcon has it also. Um, let's see. So if we consider it night birds, um, the frogmouth had better quieting features than any of the other night birds, and it is also the most owl-like in how it hunts prey. Uh, there's a paper that suggested maybe they use sound to locate prey, although again, there was no actual evidence one way or the other. Uh, and so overall, when I squint my eyes and look at the data for night birds, uh, I come away thinking that either of these hypotheses, either self-masking or stealth, either of these hypotheses could explain quiet flight in night birds. <coughs> um, oh, that's right. And so owlet night jars, potus, and night jars are taking insects. There's no evidence that these guys use hearing to find insects. And flying insects are really quiet. So the fact that these guys have the velvet is likely, is, it, it seems it, it better supports the stealth hypothesis rather than self-masking. Hawks, uh, some hawks use uh, sound to hunt and they're the ones that have the best developed uh, velvet. So that seems to support the self-masking hypothesis, maybe. But other hawks also had some velvet and don't use sound to hunt. Uh, and that includes hawks that that would uh, have no need to sneak up on their prey, like bald eagles that take fish from underwater and osprey. Uh, and also I found vultures that had the velvet as well. Vultures are eating dead stuff. Uh, clearly neither hypothesis applies to how vultures acquire their food. Uh, within falcons, uh, kestrels had the velvet and other falcons like peregrine falcon did not. Kestrels hunt pretty similarly to kites. They'll often kind of hover in place over some prey. Um, and they're not known to use sound to hunt. So the presence of velvet in them also seems to support the stealth hypothesis. Um, and then finally in owls, um, the owl species that are most reliant on sound, like, like sawwet owls or barn owls or great gray owls, they also have the best developed quieting features. So that seems to, that seemed to better support the self-masking hypothesis rather than the stealth hypothesis. Um, but I also found the literature claims that fishing owls lack quieting features. Uh, but in fact, uh, I found they had lots of velvet and that their, their, their quieting features were almost as well developed as, as were other owls. 
So I set this up as a dichotomy. You know, does quiet flight evolve for stealth or does, is it to resume self-masking? Uh, and from doing this kind of survey of the morphology that birds have that seems to be related to quiet flight, I found mixed support for both of these hypotheses. Uh, and as I said earlier, these are not mutually exclusive hypotheses. I found that these two hypotheses, stealth or self-masking, to be really helpful in organizing my thinking about why quiet flight would evolve. Um, but, but in total, this was one of those papers where I set up this question in the introduction and then I kind of meander around in the discussion because I don't have a clear answer to the, to the false dichotomy that the introduction set up. Oh yeah, and, and then some puzzles. Shrikes have, have convergently evolved to eat mice and lizards and things. Um, you might expect them to have the velvet, but I found no sign that they had velvet. And as I mentioned before, condors uh, curiously do have the velvet. I think I'm pretty much out of time. Okay, so, uh, <coughs> so I'm gonna stop talking about quiet flight and just to summarize what I've talked about in this talk, um, my research looks at how animals make noisy flight and especially how they use noisy flight for communication, such as in hummingbirds. Uh, and then more recently, I've also moved into this question of how do, how do uh, animals fly quietly and what is the role of quiet flight uh, in hunting? Um, and with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. And I think we're talking until 11, is that right? Yeah, we've got a um, question and answer session until 11 o'clock. So um, those of you who have to leave, that's, that's fine. Um, if there's anyone that would like to ask,